Good morning, and welcome to the First Unitarian Universalist Society of Albany. My name is Reverend Sam Trumbor, and I serve as minister of this congregation. Before we begin, please check to make sure your microphone is muted. The same for your camera, if your image is potentially distracting or embarrassing. Please also be mindful of your speech while on Zoom as Microphones have a way of getting accidentally unmuted. This will minimize any disruption of our service. Thanks so much for your cooperation. This is now the time of transition from ordinary time to sacred time. Time to mute or turn off your cell phone if you're not using it for this Zoom service. Close the door to distractions. Get that hot beverage in hand and get cozy and comfortable where you are sitting. Center into the rhythm of your breath. Collect your attention in this moment. Let this be for you a quiet place, away from the din. May this virtual space be your sanctuary for this hour. Zoom will present to you a frame for that space to hold the representations, sounds, music, the songs, poetry, and prose to lift your heart, broaden your mind, and move you 
to do justice in the world in the service of building beloved community. While we cannot be physically present together this morning, may this virtual service be holy and sacred time for each of us as we join together in the celebration of life. And our prelude this morning is Let It Be, not by the Beatles, this time by Malvina Reynolds. And the musician is Elena Karpov. And let us light the chalice with the words that you'll see on the, on the screen. Welcoming all free seekers of truth and meaning, we gather to excite the human spirit to inspire its growth and development, to respond morally and ethically to a troubled world, and to sustain a vital and nurturing religious community. And uh, there's a slide uh, that you could show uh, Chris that's next. If you could switch back to that slide. Today is the end of the holiday of uh, Diwali the Hindu festival of light, which signifies the victory of good over evil and knowledge over ignorance. I think we could maybe adopt this as a UU festival because not only do Hindus celebrate it, different Hindu sects celebrate a different number of stories and deities related to it. Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, and others also celebrate it with different connections to their traditions. This is one holiday with many different understandings and interpretations. That resonates with our UU sensibilities, appreciating multiple truths and meanings that lift common values. So happy Diwali. And let us sing our opening song together. And welcome to our viewers from Facebook who will be joining us now for our service. As we have more typical November weather today than the warm days that we had last week, I wonder if this could be the harbinger of future weather patterns? Or will we get warm Novembers one year and a foot of snow and icy cold winds the next? More extreme weather patterns. One thing we do know, humanity is having a big impact on this planet. Up until the middle of the 20th century, it a lot of times it was pretty negative with rivers catching on fire and DDT poisoning birds. We've just begun to think about preserving wetlands, protecting forests, and saving rivers and lakes from invasive exotic species. Yet stopping a dam project to protect tiny snail darting fish isn't universally popular. Draining wetlands was standard procedure in Florida to build houses. Valuing natural systems above human uses remains a very new way for our species to think. Let us consider today if and how human beings can both develop our civilization and in the process prevent us from spoiling our nest 
so much that we make our planet uninhabitable for humanity. But first, Leah has a story about the platinum rule. I'm sure you've heard of the golden rule, treat other people the way you want to be treated. But today's story is about the platinum rule. It comes to us from our Soul Matters curriculum and it's called the Imams and the Health Clinic in Nigeria. Nigeria is a green part of the world. It has lots of plants and trees. In this story, we have Ian Tweedy, who was an organizer who worked in Nigeria and other parts of West Africa for many years. He helped doctors and clinics there provide for the people. But this one clinic in a state in Nigeria was not well attended. The people just didn't go. And so Ian went to the leaders of the community. In this case, it was the Imams, the Islamic religious leaders. Ian sat down with the head leader, the head Imam, to try to find out why. They visited for a bit. And finally, Ian asked, how can we help? And the Imam was shocked. He had never been asked this before. And Ian knew why. Usually aid organizations like his didn't want to spend the time asking the community. They just went in and did what they thought should be done to help the people. And Ian wanted the clinic to be used, but not because he wanted to look like a good person, or because he wanted to tell the people what he thought they should do, he wanted to partner with the people. And that's why Ian asked the Imam, how can we help? Well, the Imam explained that the Muslim families in his area didn't like the family clinics. They didn't like white Westerners trying to limit the number of children families could have. However, the Imam said, we see how hard it is for mothers when they have their babies close together. And the Quran tells us to space our children out. And this is for the betterment of the mother and for the family. If the clinics provided help for the families for child spacing, then that would be very welcome. And so the clinics, this clinic in particular was called a child spacing clinic. And the imams went out and encouraged their families to use them. And when the families heard this news, they were glad for help with child spacing. And so they began to go to the clinics. And the clinics had a wonderful reputation in their community. And that's the end of the story. So have you figured out the platinum rule? It means treating other people the way they want to be treated. And that means that you have to ask. And it means that you have to listen deeply to their answers.
Thank you, Leah. It's a wonderful story of inspiration for us. Because the confusing of the platinum rule and the golden rule, very, very important to understand the difference. We have a video now that will introduce the theme of healing the planet. And I was originally thinking that I would do a meditation after the video, but I realized that the video itself could be a meditation. So I encourage you to take in this video as a meditation. It's titled Three Seconds. Fun fact, planet Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Mankind, about 140,000 years old. Let me put that in perspective. If you condense the Earth's lifespan into 24 hours, that's one full day, then we have been here on this planet for, drum roll please, three seconds. Three seconds. And look what we've done. We have modestly named ourselves Homo sapiens, meaning wise man. But is man really so wise? Smart, yes, and it's good to be smart, but not too smart for your own good. Yes, we have split the atom. Yes, we build clever machines that navigate the universe in search of new homes, but at the same time, those atoms we split created nuclear warfare. In our quest to explore the galaxy, rejects and neglects the home that we have here now, so no, that cannot be wisdom. Wisdom is different. While intelligence speaks, wisdom listens, and we willingly covered our ears to Mother Nature's screams and closed our eyes to all of her help-wanted signs. Wisdom knows that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, so if we were wise, we would not be shocked when we see storms that are stronger than ever before, or more drought, hurricanes, and wildfire than ever before, because there's more pollution than ever before, more carbon, more trees cut down than ever before. At a record pace, we have increased the extinction of animals by 1,000 times the normal rate. What a feat. In the next 10 to 100 years, every beloved animal character in every children's book is predicted to go extinct. Lions gone, rhinos gone, tiger, gorilla, elephant, polar bear gone in three seconds. Species that have been here longer than us will be gone because of us in this three seconds. In an existence shorter than a Vine video, we turn the circle of life into our own personal conveyor belt. Somebody, anybody help. We were given so much. The only planet in this solar system with life. I mean, we are one in a million. No, actually, scientifically, we are one in a billion, trillion, trillion. That's a one followed by 33 zeros. And I don't want to get too spiritual, but how are we not a miracle? We are perfectly positioned to the sun so we don't burn, but not too distant so we don't turn to ice. Goldilocks said it best, we are just right. This paradise, where we are given medicine from trees, not coincidentally, but because like the song says, we are family, literally. Everything, every species is connected genetically, from the sunflower to the sunfish. And this is what we must recognize before it's too late, because the real crisis is not global warming, environmental destruction, or animal agriculture. It is us. These problems are symptoms of us, byproducts of us. Our inner reflection, loss of connection has created this misdirection We have forgotten that everything contributes to the perfection of mother nature Corporations keep us unaware and disconnected But they have underestimated our strength Contrary to popular belief, millions are waking up out of their sleep Seeing our home being taken right up under our feet we cannot allow our history to be written by the wicked, greedy, and loony. It is our duty to protect Mother Nature from those who refuse to see her beauty. Call me crazy, but I believe we should have the right to eat food that's safe with ingredients we can pronounce. Drink water that is clean, marvel at trees, breathe air free of toxins. These are natural rights, not things that can be bargained for in Congress. See, they want you to feel powerless, but it has been said that something as small as the flutter of a butterfly's wing can cause a typhoon halfway around the world but when enough people come together, we too will make waves and watch the world into a new era filled with love and connection, freedom for all without oppression. But it is up to you, yes, you watching this behind this screen to make the effort because time is of the essence and only together can we make it to the fourth second.
let us take these thoughts that you felt and recognized in the video into our silent meditation. This is a hard sermon to deliver. Humanity's relationship with our planet is anything but healing. Humans behave more like viral pathogens in relation to the planet than its physician. Let us be grateful our scientific capabilities have advanced to the point of even being able to detect the impact we are having on the biosphere and the atmosphere. Scientists are now able to measure and predict the effects of our collective actions. And those predictions are terrifying. I follow the Reverend Michael Dowd on Facebook. Some of you may remember that he spoke here in our congregation on October 29th, 2006. Dowd gained some degree of fame in UU circles, promoting a faithful understanding of evolution in his book, Thank God for Evolution, How the Marriage of Science and Religion Will Transform Your Life and Our World. He and his scientist wife, Connie, working together are a formidable team of thinkers in that intersection of science and religion. He also tracks what is happening in the environment. He carefully monitors climate change. I followed his reposts of articles on the decrease of Arctic ice and melting of permafrost above the Arctic Circle that set up positive feedback loops, accelerating average global temperature increases. Oceans relentlessly absorb carbon dioxide. Water temperatures increase too. The amount of CO2 in the air is now 410 parts per million. Those changes have devastating impacts on coral reefs and the delicate web of life in the sea. Add to that expanding deserts, deforestation, agricultural soil nutrition, depletion, topsoil erosion, and more intense weather events, followed by more flooding and droughts and the progressive decrease of fresh water reserves 
and the planet's ability to support human life as we live now is in grave danger. Dowd would argue we are already beyond the point of no return. After running out of names for hurricanes this year, after terrible fires on the West Coast, after some of the hottest temperatures ever recorded around the world, I wasn't sure if I had anything positive to say on this subject. We, thankfully, are fortunate to live in an area with a good supply of fresh water, protection from most weather-related threats, and enough agricultural land that can feed us. Yet that doesn't insulate us from the suffering of others. We are interdependent beings sharing one planet. If anyone could give me some hope, I thought, it was Dr. Susan Trumbor, my sister, who studies carbon dioxide exchange with soils. She just received the 2020 Balzan Prize, one of the most prestigious international awards in natural science and humanities. She was recognized for her contributions in the field of earth system dynamics. Sue would know if there is any hope for us being able to stop carbon dioxide's persistent rise and return to or below the 350 parts per million that is believed to be sustainable. We talked on Tuesday and she did have a few bones to throw to me to gnaw on. Worldwide change of consciousness is no easy task, but there are some actions that will make a difference. And having an incoming president who takes climate change seriously will make a big difference. Just stopping the promotion of coal burning, fracking, and drilling for oil in the Arctic is a great first step. We already know we must stop burning fossil fuels. That is priority number one. Yet, can we do that without tanking our standard of living and returning to a pre-industrial civilization? I don't know about you, but I'm not keen on stabling a horse in my backyard. Although I think the manure would probably be good for my lawn. One of my sister's former graduate students, Dr. Margaret Torn, is working on the transition off fossil fuels. The effort is called Pathways to Deep Decarbonization. Her consortium is working at the national level to define the changes needed to get to 90% reduction of carbon release into the atmosphere by 2050. Their plans for decarbonization have four pillars. The first pillar is decarbonizing our process of electric generation and distribution. Our civilization depends on power. Electricity is the power source that can be made with the least carbon. Advances in solar and wind generation continue to be more and more affordable. Hydropower is an important source in our area. Geothermal is another viable source in certain parts of the nation. Coastal tides are another possible source. To some extent, biofuels are also carbon neutral. Nuclear, at least in the near term, remains a large source that is carbon neutral. The mix of all these can get us close to net zero release of fossil carbon. The second pillar is vastly improving our efficient use of electricity. So much heat is lost from buildings that don't have good insulation or leak heat through windows and doors. A tremendous amount of power is lost just in the transmission process. We continue to find more efficient ways to light and heat spaces. The bigger challenge today is the efficiency of computers. Engineers are always asking how they can make computer chips smaller and faster with less energy use. 
How can computers store more data per unit of power? We haven't hit the theoretical limits for how fast they can go or how much we can store per unit power consumed. The third pillar is ending fossil fuel use by electrifying transportation. Electric cars are approaching viability for many of us. When I'm home driving around town in my Prius, I don't use more than a couple of gallons of gas a month. As batteries improve, more buses, trucks, and delivery vans will be able to go electric too. The electrification of heating systems using geothermal and atmospheric heat pumps will keep us warm and cool without using gas or oil. The fourth and maybe the most controversial of their plan is the integration of carbon capture and sequestration. During the near term, we'll still need to use some fossil fuel based energy. The technology for capturing carbon dioxide at combustion sites like power plants and especially industrial applications does look more viable in the next 10 to 20 years. What is hopeful about this four-pronged approach is it doesn't depend on technology that doesn't already exist as in, and is in the process of being implemented. They've worked out the economics of these changes so they wouldn't be disruptive to our economy. Over the next 30 years, these changes can be integrated into the anticipated cycle of replacing existing transportation, heating and cooling systems with better carbon neutral systems as the old ones wear out. My sister also does work in Brazilian rainforests, measuring carbon exchange between air and soils. The pressures to burn down those forests to create pasture land for animals is intense. These forests are a major source of oxygen for us and also absorb lots of carbon dioxide. One of the ways to save the rainforests is to recognize their economic potential and their economic value as sources of natural products that might be greater than for grazing. There are many exotic and unusual plants, foods, and medicines that could be harvested at high prices. An example of this is a Colombian nut company. They do work with farmers in the Orinoquia region harvesting cacay nuts from a native tree species. The oil from these nuts is used in dozens of foods and cosmetic products. One ounce of cacao oil can cost over $30 here. Another nut harvested is the Sacha Incha, which is called the, also called the Inca peanut. It is a nutritious seed that can be eaten whole or converted to an oil that is rich in proteins and vitamins. Both forest crops are helping to restore degraded land with indigenous plants and limit deforestation. This is much better than growing coca leaves for cocaine. I like this example because it begins to chart a new way for us to relate to our planet. Rather than strive to cut down the forests and to treat the land like our servant to do our bidding, this approach begins with the ecosystem and asks, how can we collaborate with it? How can we participate in a way that benefits the ecosystem while yielding a harvest for humanity? Can we protect and restore the forest in a mutually beneficial way. This is the initiative and the spirit behind permaculture. The time for conquering and colonizing our planet is long gone. Homo sapiens, the wise ones, 
have evolved the intelligence to fix the problems we've created. We can become conscious of the results of our actions. We can take steps to address the harm we have caused. We can even use our ability to innovate, to create solutions that never existed before. Through our intelligence, we might be able to bring back the elm and the chestnut trees that once dominated our forests here. We might be able to stop the novel coronavirus in its tracks. That new vaccine that was announced is very promising using uh, RNA technology. It's very, very new. We might be able to eliminate other diseases like measles, malaria, MRSA, and meningitis that have plagued us for generations. We might be able to restore balance to ecosystems to encourage them to thrive. We might even be able to participate consciously with the evolutionary process. We might be able to be the agents of a new creation, more wondrous than the one we came to consciousness within. This approach requires us to see ourselves as a part of a system, part of a cycle of life, rather than special, divinely blessed force of domination and control of this planet. This planet wasn't created for us to exploit as a launching pad for getting to heaven. We've only been part of this planet's story for three seconds. We need a big dose of humility in our relationship to it. We enter the story of evolution perhaps in the middle, not at the apex or by any means the end. Life will continue to evolve here with humanity or without it. We bring to the evolutionary process a tremendous power, the power of self-awareness. No other species has developed this ability to our capacity. May we use it to stop harming the planet first. And if we get that figured out, maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to become a healing influence. So be it. And I'm in. An important way we celebrate life each Sunday is by offering an opportunity to practice generosity. In honor of Transgender Awareness Month and the upcoming November 20th Transgender Day of Remembrance, all contributions towards the offering today will be given to In Our Own Voices, an Albany nonprofit whose mission is to work for and ensure the physical, mental, spiritual, political, cultural, and economic survival and growth of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people of color communities. The organization, which has been around for more than 20 years, has numerous programs for the benefit of LGBT people of color. They run programs that develop leadership skills. They provide support for individuals who have experienced trauma, such as sexual violence, and hate crimes. They provide services in the areas of health education, employment, housing, hormone therapy, legal services, youth empowerment, emergency assistance, and numerous other services. The organization's primary goals are to strengthen 
the voice of LGBT people of color within the larger community and to increase the community's capacity for combating oppression and marginalization. We now have a short message from the Director of Intervention Services at In Our Own Voices. Hi everyone, this is Vanessa Gonzalez and I'm the Director of Intervention Services at In Our Own Voices. I'm here with Julius Faulkner, our Trans Care Coordinator. Um, I'm here to thank you all for thinking of us and we appreciate this service and I'm going to turn it over to Julius uh, just to talk a little bit about trans care and the Trans Day of Remembrance that's coming up. Uh, so Julius? Yes, thank you so much for inviting us and thinking of us during this time, uh, especially during Transgender Awareness Month. Uh, this month is really significant for the transgender community, especially with 2020 quickly becoming the deadliest year for transgender violence. Um, Recently, the number has raised to 34 uh, trans-related deaths uh, due to violence, and that's pr primarily trans women of color. So on November 20th, on Transgender Day of Remembrance, we will be hosting a vigil and reading of the names of those we have lost in 2020, as well as in the United States and worldwide. We will then be having a call to action speech given by London J. Precise, and it's something that you just don't want to miss. It's going to be hosted at Collins Circle on the U Albany campus. Yes, and we hope that you can join us on the live stream. We thank you so much again. Do not hesitate to reach out to us. We are located on Lark Street. Um, our phone number is 518-432-4188. Due to COVID, our offices are currently closed. However, you can always reach out to us. And if you have any questions, concerns, want more information, please do so. We thank you so much again from the bottom of our hearts for thinking of us. Um, it's wonderful and please enjoy the rest of your day. You can click on the tiny URL link in the chat window to contribute, or you can send a text to the number shown on the screen. The examples on the slide show how to label your text to indicate the amount and the purpose or intent of your gift. And now we must say goodbye to our Facebook friends. Consider joining us on Zoom next time by visiting albanyuu.org. Our offertory music is Ash Grove, a Welsh folk melody arranged by Ruth Schramm. We enjoy welcoming guests and visitors to our service. If you are a guest or visitor and would like to tell us who you are and where you're from, you can click on the blue raise hand symbol in the participant window. Our technician will unmute you and invite you to speak. You may also, or instead, click on the visitor link you'll find now in the chat window. I don't see anybody uh, raising their hands to be recognized, Dick. Oh, there's um, one person with their hand up, uh, I can see on the screen. Oh, Bruce here we Holden. go. Um, don't see that one. Elizabeth Berberian has her hand raised. Okay. And Bruce Holden has his hand raised. Uh, he's actually in the video, he has his hand raised. Okay. So you're not going to see it in the chat. Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, the reason I've had my photo off this morning is because I just adopted a new dog. Um, her name is Callie Ray, and she's a stray from Arkansas who was in a kill shelter and somehow found her way to Dutchess County where she, they sent her to a seven-week boot camp to be trained and she's 
a mud of unknown origin, <laughs> but um, I'm feeling a lot of joy this morning. Thank you. Okay, Bruce Holden, um, I'll highlight you in a moment if you could uh, unmute and introduce yourself. I just did. I think I just did. Okay. Um, I'm not the first time visitor. I used to visit years ago. Uh, I'm a member of the First Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Palm Beaches in Florida, but we gave up our home in Florida. And so I, I actually live, in, my wife and I live in Schenectady. Uh, I've been to your church before and I've even played your piano a couple of times for services years ago. Great. So it's nice to be back with you all. I was, all right. a music, I was a music director in the Palm Beach Church for a few years also. Good to, good to see you. Thanks for, thanks for uh, contributing. Thank you. So is that it, Chris? That's all I see, Dick. Okay, thank you and welcome to all who have joined us today. If you'd like to learn more about our congregation or Unitarian Universalism, you can find in the participant window, someone with welcome before their name you can reach out to that person privately in the chat window now or after the service. And now we welcome the chance to greet one another, uh, Zoom format. Uh, this is done through virtual breakout rooms. Uh, you can say hello and share your name. This will last about 90 seconds and then we'll come back together. Hello. 
This is the time set aside in our service for sharing significant personal milestones in our lives. There are three ways to share a joy or sorrow. The first option is to type your joy or sorrow in the chat window. Please put the words read aloud at the beginning of your message if you would like us to do that. Please also consider connecting privately in the chat with the pastoral care associate. You may identify the ones on duty today in the participant window. Look for PCA before their names. Today, Donna Meixner and I are on duty. The second option is to click the blue raise hand symbol in the participant window. Our te technician will unmute you and invite you to speak your joy or sorrow. The third option is to submit a joy or sorrow using our website by noon on Friday prior to the service. We'll begin by reading those that were submitted this past week. Then we'll hear the spoken joys and sorrows followed by the chat entries that are to be read aloud. Okay, we will start with uh, Chris Beistroff. Chris, if you could unmute and share your joy or sorrow. Oh, it's definitely a joy. I am feeling tremendous joy this week. And um, some of you know that I'm a scientist and I'm working on a contraceptive vaccine. Uh, this was the week that we got the results back from our mouse mating experiment that showed the contraceptive vaccine was working. And it's like, we were, oh, it's going to work. And uh, so overwhelming, wonderful joy for me in my lab. Thank you. I'm not, Sandy, I'm not seeing any others uh, with the raised hand, so we can proceed with the others. Okay, for the read alouds from Barb Manning to everyone, our granddaughter, Avon, celebrated her ninth birthday on Friday, November 13th. And from Elizabeth, from Lois Bailey, uh, please keep our friend Tina Hack in your thoughts. She is having some health issues. From Jan McCracken to everyone, Sharon Babaluk continues to work hard at Sunnyview Rehab. Her determination is inspiring to all her who know and love her. She walked 200 feet this week. She's returning home next week. And from Tammy, today is my third son's 19th birthday. From Carol Butt, my sister turns 83 today and we are doing all we can to adapt the circumstances to make it a fun birthday. It is interesting to see how we can adapt. I think we are all learning a lot in that area. From Pamela Straub to everyone, we're grateful that all family members in Liechtenstein are out of quarantine after my granddaughter tested positive. She is doing wonderfully, has her appetite back, is spunking and active. Um, from Chris Carrera. Please think of us. We will be traveling to Michigan Saturday to visit my 90-year-old father in Michigan to help in his transition to assisted living. And from the Stanfasts, our youngest granddaughter Lizzie is turning 11 tomorrow.
And what else am I missing? There's another to everyone, but does not say read aloud. You see anything else, Chris, that I'm missing? I think we've covered it. Okay. For the joys and sorrows that remain unspoken, let us hold all that we've heard and felt in our hearts. And let us receive this Ojibwe prayer as a prayer of affirmation. Grandfather, look at our brokenness. We know that in all creation, only the human family has strayed from the sacred way. We know that we are the ones who are divided. We are the ones who must come back together to walk the sacred way. Grandfather, sacred one, teach us love, compassion, and honor that we may heal the earth and heal each other. May it be so. And let us sing together our last song, Touch the Earth, Reach the Sky by Grace Lewis McLaren. And Randy and Chris will lead us. As we extinguish the chalice, please join in the words shown on the screen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.
The benediction is an excerpt from an essay by Clarissa Pincola Estes entitled, Do Not Lose Heart, We Were Made for These Times. I have heard from so many recently who are deeply and properly bewildered. They are concerned about the state of affairs in our world right now. Yet, I urge you, please do not spend your spirit dry by bewailing these difficult times. Especially, do not lose hope. Most particularly because the fact is, we were made for these times. I grew up on the Great Lakes and recognize a seaworthy vessel when I see one. Regarding awakened souls, there have never been more able crafts in the waters than there are right now across the world. And they are fully provisioned and able to signal one another as never before in the history of humankind. You are built well for these times, despite your stints of doubt, your frustrations in writing all that needs change right now. You are not alone. Look out over the prow. There are millions of boats of righteous souls on the waters with you. For many decades, worldwide souls just like us have been felled and left for dead in so many ways over and over, brought down by naivete, by lack of love, by being ambushed and assaulted by various cultural and personal shocks in the extreme. Yet remember this especially, we have also of necessity perfected the knack of resurrection. Here it is. Are you still standing? The answer is yes, and no adverbs like barely are allowed here. If you are still standing, ragged flags or no, you are able. Thus, you have passed the bar and even raised it. You are seaworthy. Our thanks go to the ushers, Tammy Hathaway, Chuck Manning, Dawn Dana, and Annika Fluger. The Pastor of Care Associates, Sandy Stone and Donna Meixner. Welcomer, Barb Manning. And myself, uh, Dick Dana, the Service Associate. Musicians, the Albany UU Virtual Choir, Elena Karpoff, Randy Rosette, and Chris Jensen. And office support, Sapphire Correa, and technical support, Chris Jensen. And I believe